We gather in the name of Jesus the Christ, our light, and the light for thousands of others like ourselves throughout the world who on this day are gathering before the light of Christ and coming to Christ's table. Before the light of Christ that calls us to live in right relationship with God, with others, and with ourselves, and with all creation, as we seek to do in his name. Let us gather for worship. Let us begin with our acknowledgement of territory. Please join these words with me and take them to your heart because as we share them, we are recognizing that the people from whom this land was sometimes taken and removed and they were pushed away still feel some pain for that and we're trying to right those wrongs. Our gathering takes place on some of the oldest foundations to be found on this planet and in a place that has been inhabited for thousands of years. Let us be aware of who we are, whose we are, and where we are. We are indeed in a place that has been inhabited for a long time. And most of us are very much newcomers on this land, despite how we might claim residence. Ancestors and newcomers agreed to live peacefully on this land in agreements with the uninspiring names of Treaty 27 and Treaty 45 and a half. Such names might not say much to inspire, but the words of those treaties tell of rights and responsibilities for all who are part of them. All of us are treaty people, whether we are here as descendants of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, the neutral peoples, the Adawa, and the Ojibwe tribes of the Saugeen, or others came to settle here, or we are new to this place. May we remember with respect the story of this land, and may our relationship with the land and the people seek restorative justice and care as we journey together into our shared future. May the sovereign Christ the Lord be with you and also with you. Not too much from me today by way of announcement, other than as a communion Sunday, we invite you, if you have opportunity, to support our benevolent fund by using this offering space on a Lakeshore envelope and placing your donation to our benevolent fund there. Andy Ross has a much more important announcement at this time. It was 22 months ago that the Affirming Committee was formed at Lakeshore to educate all of us what it means to be an affirming congregation within the United Church. A major milestone is planned for two weeks from now, October 15th, when we will hold a congregational meeting here after the service. As usual, the meeting will start with a motion to allow adherents to vote. The main motion will be for the adoption of a statement of intent the same as the one you received in the weekly email and as printed on the back of your bulletins and as shown on the screen for those watching at home. The vote will be by secret ballot on a piece of paper that each member and adherent will be given. For those who are keen to vote and cannot attend on October 15th, we will be holding two advance polls in the church office. One will be this Friday, October 6th, from noon till 1 o'clock. The other will be next Wednesday, October 11th, from noon to 1 o'clock. Applying the rules of order to our congregational meeting, someone will make the motion, someone will second the motion, and I will open the floor for questions or discussion. However, in order to complete the vote in a timely manner, the committee is giving you the opportunity to discuss it at three talking circles. You can attend any one of them, they're all the same. One right after this service in the parlor. The second one at 7 p.m. this Tuesday on the Zoom platform. Please ask Harry for the Zoom invitation link. The third talking circle will be in the parlor again at 7 p.m. this Wednesday evening. The subject of each circle is the same. What do you think about the proposed statement of intent and about Lakeshore becoming an affirming church? If you are inspired to speak, please attend but also be inspired to listen to others. One question that we still hear is something like, 
We are already a welcoming church. Why is this necessary? This has been addressed in our videos and discussions on June 8th, June 12th, and November 20th of last year. Some of the videos were shown in worship services, and we will play one more rerun later in this service as a reminder. The video answers this question. The talking circle should be able to expand on it as well. If you have questions, further questions about the process, please reach out to any committee member. Sally and David Walker, Marilyn Potter, Mandy Sinclair, Harry Disher, or myself. We thank you for your participation. Our opening hymn is number 242 in Voices United, Let All Things Now Living. join in our call to worship for this day. Siblings in Christ, God gathers us here this morning because we are God's beloved people. We open our hearts to God's tender presence. The God of hosts entrusts the future to us and calls us to be a faithful and generous people. gathering song is verse one of Now Thank We All Are Gone.
Let us join in our prayer of approach. Let us pray. Gracious God, creator and sustainer, you open your hand and fill all things living with plenteousness. Compassionate God, you enfold all people and all creation in your steadfast and transforming love. Energizing God, your spirit blows like the wind enabling all creation to grow, to be <coughs> renewed, and to flourish. Now, in a way that's respectful and safe for yourselves, share the peace of Christ using a bow and namaste, wiggling fingers, peace signs, a wave, side to side, row to row, balcony to floor, choir to congregation. Share the peace of Christ, saying, the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Invite children among us to come forward for a moment or two as we share in conversation. Company today. That was well done. You didn't race up here or run. Are there times when you go pretty fast? Do things? Yes, I see a smile there. What do you do fast sometimes? You race fast? You have racing cars at home? Yeah. Um, it's not, uh, we do a lot of things pretty quickly in this life. But there's some real wisdom in doing things slow. In fact, there's some things, if you don't do them slow, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to mess it up. You ask some of the, the people around here who do carpentry and woodwork, what's the rule? Measure twice, cut once. Slow and steady. The women who quilt in the room here on Tuesday. Do you do that quickly? No, oh, one careful stitch at a time. Knitting, you know. Well, you can go pretty fast once you know what you're doing, but it takes a while. You make a mistake, it takes a while to rip it all out. So an artist trying to sculpt a statue chisels away for quite a long time to get exactly. You make one mistake, the whole thing will fall apart. So slow, steady. So... Let me encourage you to do some things slowly. Because if you do 
You might, if you go too fast, you also might have accidents and trip over your own feet if you're running too fast. Even when you're eating food and thanking God, being blissful at the table, really, really taste that glass of milk. Really, really taste that yummy chocolate dessert in that ice cream. Don't, I gotta go. Not great. In fact, your body will process that food much more happily slow and steady. Too much quickness, in the, and there's a long, long way ahead for most of us in life. If we take our time, we'll get there just as fast as if we try to get there before everybody else. Slow and steady. Slow and steady. Not a bad way to be. Not a bad way. A great way to live. You can collect coins while we sing God of the Bible.
Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46, the parable of the wicked tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to his tenants and went away. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Then he sent his son, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, They will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces its fruits. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but feared the crowd because they regarded him as a prophet. And the word from a letter of Paul to the Philippians at a time when he felt he needed to defend himself against people who were discrediting his ministry and spreading false rumors about him. Now, if anyone else might be confident in the flesh, I am even more so. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew among Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And yet, everything I have gained, I have count as loss because of Jesus the Christ. More than that, I consider everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus the Christ, my sovereign. It's everything else is rubbish. For knowing him, sharing in his, who, for whose sake I suffer the loss of everything, that, that I may gain Christ and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but a righteousness from faith in Christ. Righteousness of God that comes from faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that I might somehow obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it, but I press on towards the goal. Not that I've already reached it. I, I press on towards it, that I might lay hold of that for which Christ has already laid hold of for me. Brothers and sisters, it's, I not, have not laid hold of it at all, but this I have laid hold of. Str forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
word of God for the people of God this day. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, reach us and teach us and bless our living and believing, our giving and receiving, our striving and achieving. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I suspect we've all met someone like them, that bull in the china shop man, that whirling dervish woman, that person bound and determined to get what they are headed, come hell or high water. They race full out, nonstop to their destination, and as a cold traveler, don't mention that you are hungry. At great risk, say, I could use a restroom soon and need to pull over to deal with a crying baby, fat chance. If your arthritis flares up and you're sitting on your inflamed hip, too bad. The Allura Gorge may only be five minutes off the highway. Tough, you're not going to get to see it if it's not en route. There is apparently no time to spare. That compulsive driver will only stop when the gas gauge hits E. Grab a snack, have a pit stop then, be darn sure you're back in the car when the tank is full again. And if you reach your destination in less time than the auto club or GPS estimated it would take, that driver will be ecstatic. No matter how wonderful the destination might turn out to be, the anxiety fixation of the driver has sabotaged and spoiled the trip already. He or she is that person who fixes their watch in restaurants that promise lunch in 15 minutes or less, or it's free, <laughs> and hope it will be take more than 15 minutes, that same person will be just as frenzied in getting a meal ready or completing some project. All that matters is arriving on time or ahead of time or getting something done without interruption or delay. Oof. Well, how else might one live and have one's being in the world? Check this out. To all the saints in Philippi, wrote Paul. My brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Sovereign One. I don't consider that I made it on my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus the Christ. Man in motion and on a mission, but it's not a mad dash. This new life of faith in which Paul has become thoroughly immersed is no straight-on sprint to a perceivable finish line. It is an endeavor in which he encourages his beloved believers in Philippi to likewise embrace. Most of his Greek verbs in this text are in the present or present progressive tenses. So it's more about the journey or the race than it is about that goal down the road. Philippi was actually hundreds of furlongs up the coast from Marathon Bay. But the story of that first historic run by the messenger Pheidippides, who left the battle against the Persians as the tide was turning, kept on treading over hill and dale for 26 cross-country miles till he reached Athens to announce victory for Greece, that story still had currency 400 years later when Paul was writing. The race that is set for believers is, in Paul's perspective, like a marathon. Despite all preparations and training, regardless of whatever shape one may or may not be in, setbacks will likely surface, detours will need to be taken. But eventually, somehow, sometime, finishing will happen. That will be glorious, like gaining a prized laurel wreath for one's efforts. And that is a far, far different prospect from holding fast to a set course with rules and regulations, keeping on a straight and narrow route, having a virtual guarantee that when the finish line comes in sight, loudspeakers 
will blare, welcome to heaven, well done, good and faithful servant, come claim your trophy. No, the life in Christ is a different race altogether, different format. Like Paul, we get to live towards fullness of power and wholeness made available for Jesus crucified, through Jesus crucified and risen. As we seek to appropriate and latch onto that resurrection hope and power now, we are grasped and led by the one who offers it. Jesus has already shot out his arms to enfold us and possess us, and that frees us to run without having to keep tabs on our feet or having to count our steps or feeling some sense of having to compete with other followers of Jesus who are running with us at their own rate. We're simply fed on the way and led on our way and sped on our way by grace. There is no seductive, easy presentation of the gospel here that guarantees a believer wealth or optimum health or untainted conscience or flawless actions. Consider these incisive comments by the American preacher Fred Craddock. Paul portrays himself in the least relaxed, most demanding posture he knows as a runner in a race. His language is vivid, tense, repetitious, pressing, stretching, pushing, straining, and in those words, the lungs burn, the temples pound, the muscles ache, the heart pumps, and the perspiration rolls. It's not about exhaustion or torturous exercise, more about endurance and persistence. And yet, because of the surpassing worth of Jesus, the Christ, our sovereign, and living so as to acknowledge that with every fiber of our being, we can muster its worth all that effort. Everything else besides that, says Paul, we can consider disposable garbage. Forget what lies behind. Strain forward to what lies ahead. Fullness of life. And embrace the journey. Enjoy the process. And just run as you are able. And I would guess that we actually have met and known and felt motivated by other drivers who have raced towards their destination in this alternative manner. Paul's striving became a living model for the Scottish pastor Oswald Chambers. It found its way into his lectures for students at Bible College in Clapham, England, and then into spiritual encouragement that he gave to talks to Australian and New Zealand soldiers on the battle lines in Egypt during World War I. After his untimely death in 1917, Chambers' wife published a collection of his talks. It's a little book that became a, a classic in Christian devotion. My utmost for God's highest. It's not about our doing for God. It's about our being for God and our being in God. His entry on Paul's notion of pressing on in Philippians 3.12 reads like this. Christian perfection is not and can never be human perfection. Christian perfection is the perfection of a relationship with God which shows itself in the irrelevancies of human life. God's not after perfecting me to be a specimen in God's showroom. God is getting me into a place where God can use me. So let God do what God likes. The biblical notion of perfection has zippling, zippo to do with becoming flawlessly upright and moral. It has more to do with maturation, with growth and transformation. More about handing ourselves over to a process, an evolution. More about that than pursuing a goal. 
One of Mother Teresa's biographers makes note of an afternoon press conference held the day she arrived at Cambridge University to receive an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree later on from the chancellor who at the time was Prince Philip. The reporter asked her, what made you start your work? What inspired you and kept you going during so many years? And Mother Teresa answered, Jesus. The reporter looked disappointed. He must have expected long explanation, but was told only one word. But for Mother Teresa, that one word summed up her whole life to explain her faith, her enterprise, courage, love, devotion, efficiency, single-mindedness. Jesus. All I want is to know Christ and to experience the power of Christ's resurrection. I keep striving to win the prize for which Christ Jesus has already won me for himself. St. Paul's words have a long extended energizing history of resonancy and currency. And the best news may be that as people of faith, none of us is in this race alone. We're in it together. Paul's words were given to a whole community of believers, and they still are. So it does not matter how well or how poorly any of us runs, or how fit or unfit we may be. It was during a race in the Special Olympics held in Seattle some years ago that a young boy stumbled and fell. And when they heard him cry, the other eight runners turned around, went back to him. And one girl with Down syndrome bent down and kissed him. This will make it better, she said. And then they got him up, and all nine of them linked arms and walked over the finish line together. All people of faith will falter, stumble, suffer their way to maturity in Christ to that upward call of perfection that yearns for fullness of being in God. You remember how the author of Ep Epistle to Hebrews once counseled us, let's run with perseverance the race that's set before us, keeping our focus on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Like other congregations elsewhere, we're a community of marathoners. We won this race by journeying together. We've chosen to run this race with one word emblazoned on our minds, one heart beating within our hearts, one spirit enlivening our spirits. Jesus. And with thousands of congregations throughout the world today, we gather at the table of that Christ to nourish that spirit within us. And like many people of other times, other places who have been, are, or yet may be, we are invited to run towards wholeness and fullness of life embraced by grace. And like them, we are led, carried by a dying one whose arms were flung wide to free us all, to free us all, to grow, to be transformed, to rise. Thanks be to God. And thank you for the offerings you make as we seek to achieve God's purposes through this congregation. As we think about our offerings today and think about the kind of community we might want to become and choose to become, here's again is a short video. At my age, I've been from when it was illegal to be gay to now being almost totally openly gay and not fearing for our lives. 
So we as LGBTQ2S plus members don't necessarily um, feel safe in all the circles that we navigate our lives through. And so in order to feel safe in a space, we have to be truly embraced and truly accepted for who we are and who we love. And that includes some work on the part of faith communities in terms of being very public, intentional and explicit about their desire to welcome us in and their acceptance of us as who we are and for who we love. If you've been shut out for so long and you're used to being excluded, when you hear everyone is welcome, you may not believe that it applies to you as well. I had gone from Sunday school teacher, choir member, uh, member in good standing with the church to being escorted to the door because I told the truth during a meeting that I was gay. And there were sufficient people at that meeting who were not going to tolerate that. And so I was escorted to the door. In truth, it broke my heart. I think that becomes very difficult, uh, you know, when uh, uh, churches um, uh, don't follow that kind of affirming belief. I mean, that is our perspective on, on the faith here. Uh, some other uh, denominations and uh, churches do not follow that or do not lean into that as uh, strongly as we do. And I think in doing so, it diminishes uh, the people of God. It's simply not right in terms of, uh, from a human rights point of view, uh, all need to be included. Uh, that's not only the law, it's also uh, an ethical principle, and that needs to be followed, if anywhere, especially within churches. It took me a long time to come back. I did miss having a church to call home. Kamloops United Church is a really good example of an affirming church. A truly affirming church to me has members of the queer community within it, uh, holding positions of um, you know, significance within the church itself, a space where individuals in the LGBTQ2S plus community feel safe among other individuals who are also in attendance with that faith community, and where people are free to show up as their true and full authentic selves. Certainly Kamloops United Church is a space, I think, where many members of the queer community feel very, very welcome. There are many very visible signs of inclusion um, outside the church. So there's the, the ramp as you walk up with the pride colors. There's a pride flag in the window. And as well, on the outside of the church, a big affirming ministry sign that's there year round. So for members of the local LGBTQ2S plus community, certainly it's a sign of welcome and embrace and open arms. And so certainly a space that we feel safe in occupying. The placement of that quilt is very intentional. When you come through the main sanctuary doors, that's the first thing you see, intentionally. The rule here is, it is never to be moved. <laughs> Shall we gather at the river Where bright angel feet have trod With its crystal tide forever Flowing by the throne of God Yes, we'll gather at the river The beautiful, the beautiful river Gather with the saints at the river That flows by the throne of God Let us now receive our offer. Receive our offerings, O oh God, and with them receive us too, heart, mind, body, and soul. Use us and our gifts to fulfill your vision for humankind and all creation. 
We offer our time, our talents, and all that you might fit us to be, agents of your coming realm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come now with brothers and sisters and siblings in Christ throughout the world to celebrate the sacrament of communion this day. All my relations are called to this table. Our hymn is number 477, verses 1 to 3. Consecration. The Sovereign One be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give God our thanks and praise. As long as the rivers flow, our Creator has accompanied us. And so on this day we remind ourselves. And so, as we do with all families, for all of creation is in relationship with us. In the name of the one who was between heaven and earth. And so when we do not treat each other as children of the divine. For in all of creation is all my relations. So on this day, all my relations are called to this table where Jesus offers nurture, affirmation, love for all my relations. And he took a loaf. Here, this is my body. This is my blood. The lost and the lonely ones, the hurt and the broken ones, all belong to you. And so he offered his life for all my relations to give us eternal life, no longer than the rivers will flow forever and ever. Amen. Forever and ever until the realm of God 
unfolds and finally comes, the realm for which Jesus taught us to pray together, say, Our Father and Mother who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, is broken for us and for all my relations. Jesus Christ, the true vine, his blood is poured out for us, for all my relations. Let us come to the table, to the feast of life, wholeness, and fullness of life. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, take and eat. Jesus the Christ, the true vine, take and drink. pray. Eternal God, we thank you. You have called your people from the east and the west and north and south to feast at the table of Jesus the Christ. Keep us faithful to your will. Go with us to the streets and rural roads, to our homes, our places of labor and leisure, that whether we are scattered or together, we may be proactive about building and living into right relationships within the church and throughout the world and all creation. Amen. Hymn number 674, verses 1 and 2. We have tasted God's goodness. We have noticed God's generosity and fairness. We have received God's grace and transforming power. Let us go out to live love, serve others, savoring the energy and connectedness of this meal. May communion with God through Jesus the Christ and with each other inspire all our words, all our actions, all our thoughts, all our prayers. <laughs>